All right, everyone. Welcome back to Masari's Unqualified Opinions. I'm Ryan Selkis at 2 Bit Idiot on Twitter, live from the Citadel with another glorious recording with another Citadel member. Different undisclosed lo location, but we just found out we're actually not too far away from each other. For OPSEC purposes, I will not disclose either of our states, um, but I'm talking today with Joe Leleuz, who's the CEO and co-founder of Bison Trails. We're going to talk all things crypto infrastructure. Uh, we're going to talk about which code bases are rat nests and uh, which of his customers actually have a chance. I'm kidding only a little bit because uh, we do want to, we do want this to be entertaining. Um, but, uh, but Joe, you know, we're going to cover a lot of territory. Uh, you and I are kindred spirits in the sense that we are both picks and shovels providers in the wild west. Um, so tell me a, a little bit about your uh, origin story within crypto, just to kind of level set with everybody, and then um, and then how you came to to Bison Trails <laughs> and the great named Bison Trails, which is one of the few companies like Masari that uh, omitted the words Bit Blockchain Crypto from our names. Yeah, we were. Which looking, I think it's important. Yeah, we we, we were looking for. Um a negative uh what, what's the what's the equivalent of a negative bump in valuation if you omit <laughs> blockchain and you omit bit you omit um i believe that brings your valuation down the same way as if you add it right if you can you know i think i think i think in bull markets that's true i think in bear <laughs> markets is probably the opposite <laughs> um appreciate the hey first off super happy to be here um thank you for not disclosing my location even though we uh, <laughs> we we talked a little bit about it before we, we got recording. I uh, appreciate that, um, and uh, and really appreciate the kind words about the name. Um, it, it's actually a, you know you, you mentioned we're both in in the sort of picks and shovels business uh, in the wild west. Um, the name Bison Trails is actually a hat tip to that. Uh, so and 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 great segue into a little quick you know origin story into my my sort of foray and, and background into crypto. Um, you know the, the I actually like to say that my origin story for crypto is kind of boring because the truth is it's a little bit boring. It's not like some crazy moment. It's just my co-founder and I are both technical and we're just huge nerds. Um, we got involved in the, in the crypto space uh, pretty early on, but not as investors or not as builders or not as, you know, people that are clairvoyant and can see the future just because we saw this really crazy, uh, you know, decentralized concept and this new concept of, of finance and money. Uh, and we were crazy intrigued by the technology behind it. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the first times I ever heard about Bitcoin was uh, there was this engineer that was working on our team at, at a different company, a previous, you know, a previous company. Uh, and after he had left, uh, he had left the company. After he had left, we had found these long running processes on the servers that he was managing. He was an infrastructure engineer. And it turns out they were Bitcoin miners. Uh, we, at the time, I had no idea what it was. We found out and we're like, what is this Bitcoin thing? This was, you know, probably around 2011 or 12. Uh, and so that, that was kind of my first experience with it. Ever since then, I was very intrigued by the movement, the space, the, the uh, combination and, and sort of cross-section of deep, deep technology and cryptography with uh, financial and economic behavior and social behavior and social economics. Um, super, super interested, super interesting topic to me. Uh, and so um, from there, I sort of made crypto uh, and blockchains a hobby. Um, and so I spent a lot of time reading, following along projects, um, doing things like, you know, angel investing in new projects and new, new protocols. And I mean, if you want to call it angel investing, you know, whether that's in time or uh, money or buying new assets and using all the weird experimental uh, technology. And then uh, in, in around 2016, uh, my longtime co-founder and I, we'd, we'd built a few companies in the past, decided we were going to work on something new. And we could not get away from this idea that uh, blockchains and um, transfer value networks and crypto was going to be the future of technology. Uh, it was an ev inevitability that we wanted to be a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, there was a, a whole bunch of reasons why that was. And, you know, I'll, I'll save like a three year sort of exploration story. Um, but uh, we decided we wanted to sort of build a few different projects in the space. Um, and one of the projects we built was uh, we actually started looking at really early infrastructure in the blockchain space, which mostly consisted of proof of work mining. And we built a, a proof of work mine in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and the, the way we went about that was actually driving through the, you know, random middle parts of the country and getting on, you know, little planes and like Southwest flights to the middle of nowhere and looking for spaces and um, finding really inexpensive power 
Uh, and so when we were naming bison trails, uh, it was a sort of hat tip to this experience of kind of traveling from the east because we're based out of New York uh, through the country uh, to the west uh, during this like wild west period of like exploration of crypto. And, um, bison are really interesting animals and um, during the gold rush, um, they actually paved these trails that pioneers would follow across the country. Uh, and so there's a sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, a, a, a combination there between what we're trying to do with, with infrastructure and helping pave the path forward for a lot of new pioneers in the crypto space. <laughs> and, uh, it's, 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 it's a brilliant uh, kind of double whammy and, and yeah, yeah. I love the name, uh, you know, uh, people, um, don't, some people know, uh, cause I've mentioned it before. Others don't uh, know the origin around, you know, Masari, which is, it's similar, right? It, first of all, it's, it, it kind of sounds cool. sounds like Ferrari. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's basically named after the Italian merchants that have to double, uh, double entry bookkeeping. Right? Awesome. So our whole push on transparency and metrics and everything, um, it's, you know, is, is the crypto revolution and triple entry uh, bookkeeping going to be as revolutionary? We think so. And, and it kind of speaks to the data side. So, um, I think, um, and I don't take credit for that, by the way, that was our first hire. Um, I shouldn't even admit to what the, the working name was, which we knew was going to be a placeholder, but, uh, but let's just say Masari was an upgrade. Um, so, you know, you're, you, you guys are in a unique position because um, you're working with Ethereum and all of its friends, right? Um, or sure. as we call it here, ETH and ETH killers. Uh, but the other, the other projects now that we're in a bear market don't like saying that. Uh, in a bull market, they're they're perfectly content. <laughs> you know, out of the projects that you're working with, because there's about um, I think about like 25 now between kind of yeah. live and and testnet. Yeah. Um, right. What are what are some of the um, what are some of the top things that you look for as you vet a protocol team, and whether you should spend time supporting them? Is it um, just kind of common sense, hey, there's been a certain amount of venture raised and, and we kind of know and like the team and they've got a track record um, or, or kind of what's the method behind the madness for uh, operationalizing support for, um, for some of these you know, emerging assets, the test nets even, which, which you guys are far ahead of? Yeah, um, so great question. Apologies uh, if you heard my phone just ring. Uh, just now, the, the nope. joys of okay. working from home. Um, I hope <laughs> I hope that didn't come through in the audio recording. Um, I, you know, so one one thing I would say, one one thing I would just like to clarify is is that using the word vetting because I think it it sets the wrong tone or the wrong and and not deliberately, but you know, sets the wrong expectation for how we work with protocol teams. Um, the the uh, the way that we work with them is much more collaborative. Um, it's way more. It it, it started way more organically. Uh, and has um, become even more uh, collaborative over time. And so really early on, it was just my co-founder and I spending time in where the developers, the core developers, the open source developers of these different protocols were. So if that's a Discord or a Riot chat or a Slack channel or some forum. Um, and it was really mostly in, in trying to explore what they were working on, what they were doing. Um, and so I, we don't really necessarily vet projects, although, Ultimately, that is kind of what does happen um, because we have to decide where we're going to spend our time uh, and, and time being you know, one of the most valuable resources that we have. Um, and so to answer your question more pointedly, it really does come down to understanding the mission and vision of the project itself. Uh, and then, <laughs> like you said in, in the, the intro, um, spending some time in the code, understanding what the team is capable of, what's the pace of innovation, what are they trying to achieve? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's sort of an importance that um, we have as a very technical team. So, you know, Bison Trails is mostly an engineering organization, um, and we do spend a lot of time doing what we would consider some pretty unscalable work in a sense that, you know, we're, we're deep in the communities and deep in the code and often making either suggestions to open source, um, to, to open source uh, uh, projects or um, even, you know, committing code ourselves uh, or involved in things like um, governance procedures, councils, those kinds of things to help govern um, different projects. And so, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is, like you said, Ethereum and its friends, Ethereum killers or eth eth Ethereum replacers or Ethereum complements. Um, I don't think we comment on whether or not that's true. It's more like, yeah, we want to help a lot of these different protocols succeed and deploy and orchestrate and, and launch. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, 
for us as a, as a company, our mission is to, uh, you know, enable access to these different blockchains and we succeed when many of these other blockchains succeed as well. Um, so it really ends up being like understanding what their mission is, what they're trying to do. Do we as a technical team believe that what they're trying to do is possible? Um, and then are they actually trying to achieve that goal? You know, are they actually putting the, the, you know, the rubber to the road, so to speak, are they, are they committing code? Are they working on solving these problems? And you'd be surprised in the crypto space. If you actually look at the GitHubs of hundreds of these projects, different crypto projects, there's zero activity or there's one person that's committed, you know, one code change in the last like six months. And you're like, wow, this is actually a pretty popular project. Um, popular from a, a media perspective or popular from a community perspective, but like no one's really working on it. It's a little bit uh, disheartening or a little bit discouraging. And so um, I would say that that'd be like a major criteria for us is like paying attention to where uh, engineers are spending their time and their efforts. Yep. Um, uh, the quick and dirty way to monitor that is, is just look at the GitHub repo and, and kind of see totally. the presence at, at developer conferences and, and you know, there's a, a little bit of common sense involved. Um, the, you know, you're, you're talking about a number of different types of blockchains as well. And, and, your, and I think your support extends not just to the public permissionless chains, but, uh, but layer two chains, uh, more permissioned implementations like Libra, uh, which just me recently made that switch. Um, where do you uh, generally think your, your efforts are going to triangulate you know, going forward? Will it continue to be on, on public? Or, or do you think that there is a world where managing permissioned blockchains for enterprises or, or you know, for other you know, central banks that might ask, um, that becomes as big or, or bigger than, than the permissionless set right now, with Libra probably being right on that borderline? Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's a, you know, it's a good question because it, it uh, you know, I, I think like we've been very careful to uh, not explicitly say we only support permissionless blockchains or we only support permission chains or we're an enterprise blockchain company. Um, and, that, and that's because I actually think it's the, it's maybe a mischaracterization of the, of our desired efforts. You know, it's, it's, it's really, we, we want to help support the ecosystem and we built the company in this, uh, in, in, in the sort of shadow of this idea that um, the infrastructure in the space is incredibly immature. And that's true for mm -hmm. enterprise blockchains. It's true for permission to blockchains. It's true for permissionless blockchains. Um, I will say that as a company and as a founding team, we have a soft spot for permissionless networks, for censorship resistance, for some of the, the, the you know, crypto fundamentals that are really interesting and, 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 and you know, what I think is still incredibly experimental. Um, and so we love working on permissionless chains and we love working on, um, we love working on these different projects. Um, I would say that like, you know, the majority of our efforts are going to um, probably continue to be where most of the developers are focusing. Um, because I think like that's where, uh, that's where the, that's where the interesting, you know, that's where the interesting things are happening, you know, and, and um, we're seeing more and more, uh, uh, you know, attempts at per permissioned or, or sort of like closed networks and um, things like Libra, uh, for instance, are, are a really interesting opportunity for us, not because it's permissioned or permissionless, but because of the potential reach um, that a project like Libra has for the entire crypto space. Um, and then you have something like, you know, uh, Celo or Near or Solana or, you know, any of the other Ethereum friends or Ethereum killers, as, as you would say. Um, and they have really great developer communities as well. Uh, and so it's, you know, I, I kind of feel like we're in a position where we can help support uh, these different ecosystems in a similar way without making a judgment call as to one, whether one is better or worse. Um, we'll sort of let the market decide that. We'll also let um, folks that have very, very, very strict, like crypto fundamental opinions about that. And, and you know, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with those opinions. It's just, it's, it's more for us, like, how do we solve this infrastructure problem? And um, and not necessarily pick like a, an opinion that, that that's the right one. That's the winning one. Mm -hmm. um, j just a point of clarification. Are, are you, all of the chains that you currently support and have on the roadmap are staking chains, correct? So we, we, um, this is something, yeah, this is something we've been pretty quiet about. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I'll, maybe I'll get in trouble from my team for even mentioning this. 
Um, so our, our infrastructure platform is specifically designed for staking chains, for proof of stake networks. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea there is that uh, proof of stake networks, because of the nature of consensus in those networks and the way that the technology works, you need incredibly high availability, security, redundancy, and the kinds of things that you would want from a, a really robust infrastructure platform. Um, so mm -hmm. we've set the bar super high for the technology that we, that we run and the platform that we run. What that means is that we can actually run infrastructure on networks that have maybe a lower bar because of a slightly different requirement set. So uh, things like Bitcoin or Ethereum that are not proof of stake or Dcash or um, really just ways for folks to interact with the, the chain itself, but not create blocks or validate or produce blocks. And we do run infrastructure on those networks as well. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, things like Libra, which isn't a proof of stake network, it's a, what, you know, you could arguably say is a proof of authority network um, because there, you know, it, it's uh, no one is actually staking or delegating digital assets behind a validation or a block production node. Um, we do support a lot of, uh, we support proof of authority networks as well. Um, and, and in that they have a similar bar from a security redundancy and an availability perspective, um, but uh, don't necessarily, they just have a different mechanic for uh, how, trust is built or earned in that network. And so we do, we, do, we support proof of stake networks, uh, pretty much mostly proof of stake networks. And we also support things like proof of authority networks um, as a point of clarification. Uh, and then we also help a lot of, you know, large scale custodians, exchanges, asset managers, funds that want to run uh, highly available, secure private nodes in, in all of these different um, blockchain networks, uh, create reliable read and write access to the network. Um. So, you know, the, uh, I think the, the early days for uh, staking networks are a mixed bag. Um, yeah. The, uh, your, your ultimate pricing, are, are you uh, running any pools uh, or are you just providing the infrastructure for folks that want to run pools and, and, you know, maybe working with the foundations on, on their own redundancies today? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we mostly work with, um, although, so we don't really, I, I like the, 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 the concept of, of pooling is, is, is right, um, although we don't really call them that. And we mostly help support folks that want to participate themselves in the networks. So folks that want to, you know, quote unquote, run their own pools, run their own validators in the network. Um, what that means is that if, you know, Masari wanted to run a Cosmos validator, you could, Masari could use Bison Trails as a platform to run a Mas Masari Cosmos validator, as opposed to if you were just holding Cosmos or Atoms and you wanted to delegate those, you could probably delegate them to anybody. And the idea here is that you could put, we are enabling a, you know, a company like Masari or a fund or an asset manager or a custodian or an exchange to participate themselves in the network and participate in things like governance and voting and staking and helping secure the network. And so um, that's, that's our bread and butter. Um, that being said, we do generally run a Bison Trails node in every network that we support on our platform. It's a way for us to dog food our own product. It's a way for us to support folks that are maybe, you know, smaller holders in the network, but they still want to use Bison Trails because we have a great reputation for security and infrastructure. So, you know, if Joe Laluz, for instance, or, you know, if Ryan wanted to, you know, stake his 45 atoms on the Cosmos network, he probably wouldn't run a Cosmos validator. He would most likely delegate to someone else and, um, so Ryan could still delegate to a Bison Trails node. Um, so the idea is we're kind of behind the scenes, but we also like to make sure that we're participating in the network as a good community member. When are you going to set up a sidecar fund? It seems <laughs> like a no-brainer. So yeah, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm serious, right? Like, you know, uh, if you have all the infrastructure set up and, and yeah. you have a node for, for each, you know, the, the two and 20 model works like a charm here and, yeah. and it's on autopilot just to kind of allocate on a market cap basis, no? Yeah, so so I wish what you just said about it's on autopilot to uh, uh, allocate on a market cap basis was true. I actually think that being an, uh, a fund administrator and an investor is a very different job than being an infrastructure provider. And so what we like to do is partner with really great funds as opposed to creating a sidecar fund. So we work with really great funds. We work with some of the best in the world um, and we help power their participation in those networks as opposed to building a fund ourselves. Um, I'm not... Instead of two and twenty, you're very capital. You're 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 very uh, satisfied with five or ten. I'm sure. <laughs> it's it's just it's just a different core. Uh, it's a different core uh, competency. Completely different core competency. And and yep. and I think the folks that we partner with, that we work really closely with, that are our customers, know that, and they're excited to work with us. And we're really excited to work with some of the best folks in, in the space. So, 
Um, I actually think you're highlighting one of the bigger problems in the crypto space is that a lot of people try to do everything. Um, and, and truly that's something that we are trying to stay away from. So it's like, we don't want to be a fund. We don't want to be an investor. We're not, we're hundred percent non-custodial. So we don't take custody of assets. Mm -hmm. We want to be an infrastructure provider <laughs> and that's what we do because we do it well. Uh, well, you know, the other thing that, that uh, aside from just focusing, the other thing that that really helps with is, uh, actually getting closer to true decentralization, not just in name, but in practice, particularly for staking networks, which are at, uh, at you know most risk, um, you you can have centralization of mining and Bitcoin because there's there's always going to be these competitive pressures um, to you know mine the next block. But if you own a staking network, you're entrenched, right? Um, yeah. You you are now part of the new rentier class. Yep. So um, you being in the position that you are have a a pretty good look at actual decentralization versus decentralization theater. <laughs> um, and I, and uh, not necessarily um, like shitting on, on, on any projects that might have yeah. different balances of stakeholders. But, um, you know, how, uh, how do you think about network health and how it evolves over time based on, on where resources are pulled in? Do you ultimately become a point of centralization um, yourselves at some point working with all these funds um, in terms of critical infrastructure, because as many redundancies as you have, if there's an outage or, or there's a regulatory regime that says yep. we don't like this blockchain, and yep. then they trace it back the, the support back to you, well, that that could create a pretty meaningful problem um, for the network itself. So there, there's there's like three or four different things to unpack there, but I, I'm curious how you kind of map out um, security concerns when it comes to decentralization. Yeah, I think, um, so it's a great question. And it's one of the things that traces all the way down to uh, the company's DNA and the ethos of myself and my co-founder and what we actually, quite frankly, care about, what, what we give a shit about. Um, <laughs> and and that's, that's the truth. So um, there's two, two ways that we've generally been thinking about it. The first is that um, if we can, and this is something we're still constantly working on, um, we build our platform in a way that helps with distribution and decentralization. And it's something that we're constantly working on. And, and that comes from a technology standpoint. So we do things like we're hundred percent multi-cloud, we're multi-zone and multi-region. The platform we build is automated and redundant in the sense that it can recover itself. And if there's an outage on a cloud provider and on the East coast, because there's a disaster, we can easily move to a different cloud provider or a different zone or different region without having cause it, without causing blips in the network. Similarly, like you said, because we're at a very low level in the network itself, we have a really good understanding of the fact that, you know, maybe a, like 70% of the network is running on Amazon AWS East and no one else knows. They don't realize. And so we do take a sort of like good actor approach to that, where if we realize these things are happening, we will help distribute nodes across different parts of the world and different parts of uh, different, different um, cloud providers and different zones and different regions. And that, that, that entirely is, you know, that's, that's one of those things that uh, is baked into our company DNA is not necessarily verifiable and is something that like, you know, our customers trust and, and our, our reputation and brand relies on, but is something that we are working towards building technology to help open that up and show that that's true and, and show those things that are, um, you know, more, more, verifi more verifiable. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the first thing. The second thing is that the line in the sand around decentralization is kind of arbitrary and it depends on who you're talking to and people will draw the line in the sand, basically right in front of wherever they are. Um, it seems like human nature is kind of like that. So I think like, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like the Craft Brewers Association being owned by Sam Adams. So every year right. <laughs> the market the market share percentage ticks up by like one point, right? Yeah. Because they keep getting bigger. No, that's, 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 exactly, that's exactly right. And so um, I think that like we owe it to the community and to the ecosystem to be honest with ourselves and, and say like, sure, if we are working with a lot of these really great funds and custodians and exchanges and token holders, we can become a point of failure and we're trying not to do that. And we're doing a bunch mm -hmm. of other things outside of that. So things like making sure that we're set up, not just in the United States, but in different regulatory regimes as well. Um, making sure that we are, um, you know, not taking on too much uh, of, a net, of a particular network um, in the event that we do have some issues. Like, and we've done this in the past where, you know, when the company was a little bit younger, we had a little bit of concern about like, you know, maybe one piece of technology and we had customers that would put us at a position where we were, we would be running more than 
uh, F of a network in a Byzantine bulk. Uh, and we decided to not take those customers on. And we said, we're sorry, we're not going to because this is too much of a risk for the network itself. Uh, and that's bad for us, right? So we also recognize that as participants in the network and trying to be good community members, uh, we <laughs> need to do a good job. And if we don't do a good job, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot there as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's a few things that we're working on in, in that respect. Um, I would say the most important thing is that Bison Trail, and this is something we have voted on in, in governance proposals, like for instance, in the Cosmos network, um, there was a proposal to uh, do some kind of correlated slashing, where if like more than one validator went down at once, uh, you would get slashed much more. And the idea was like, basically stop folks that were doing stuff like us. And we were saying like, look, like that actually helps us because it, it hurts someone you know, much smaller player that's like, you know, running on Amazon because they only know how to run on Amazon, whereas like we can actually run across like a whole bunch of different providers and we can move things around easier. And so it encourages people to have like professional setups. Um, and we, we, we were very open and clear about that. We're like, if, you know, this is, this is great for us. Don't do it. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and so we're, we're just trying to do our best to, to help the communities move forward and help them do the right thing. Um, it's, it takes honestly, like, it's weird because we're, we're working in all these different networks that are permissionless and meant to be trustless. But the truth is like, we're actually asking a lot of our customers and the communities to trust us as we continue to build out the technology to make it better. Um, yep. you know, so it, 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 it's hard. I, I will say like, the last thing I'll say about it is, I think if you're using Bison Trails and you're using a platform that had, or a platform like Bison Trails, um, you're using a platform that has a redundancy and availability uh, built into it, you're probably doing a better job than if you're running it on a Raspberry Pi in your dorm room. Um, for the network itself. Uh, and so that's something, you know, sort of worth considering, like where in, where in the sand are you drawing the line around decentralization? Yep. Um, well, let's talk about decentralization then. Uh, and, okay. and you guys have been very high profile um, <laughs> as a supporter of Libra. We talked a little bit about it uh, at the onset there just last week, um, some changes to the kind of core design principles of the project in, in which it, it will be a permissioned system yep. uh, for the foreseeable future. And obviously that's for not a you know, bait and switch reasons, it's, it's for regulatory reasons and, and just their yeah. ability to actually get this project off the ground. Um, but um, you know, what, is, what has been your take on Libra uh, versus other projects? I, I don't want to go, you know, basically do like, you know, the tenderization of your entire like ecosystem of, of, uh, of supported blockchains. But I feel like we need to do at least one because sure. Facebook has just, unlimited resources compared to the rest of crypto, right? They, yeah. they, they have, they can fund more engineering than the entire crypto market combined um, oh, to yeah. go towards this effort. And they, and they are right. Um, so, you know, you're, 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 you're talking about uh, just an immense amount of human capital that, that's getting, you know, put at this project. It is immense in terms of the scale that it could hit if it is allowed to get released and it does live up to some of the early promise. Um, how, um, you know, what, what do you think is misunderstood technically about the Libra project right now in terms of development mm -hmm. quality, in terms of speed, in terms of, um, extensibility of the platform and, and really how disruptive this could be, um, even if it's permissioned and, and maybe, you know, they would argue in their marketing language, this isn't disruptive. This is like a rising tide thing. Um, but in, in reality, right? Like how much oxygen can they, can they attract here um, if they're able to, to get off the ground based on the, the core product and, and what's been built so far? Yeah. So um, that's an awesome question because I think, I do think that there's a few pieces around, especially specifically around the technology that are um, I, maybe misunderstood or maybe understood by not, a, not enough people. Uh, and, uh, and I think, um, I think the most important thing that, okay, so, so yes, you're hundred percent right. Facebook has an immense amount of resources to be able to solve, to try and solve some of these problems. Um, and I like the idea that this isn't, you're not, you know, we're not framing this as like permission versus permissionless, but more like what is actually happening in the technology space around this project that is interesting. And I think for me, one of the most impressive things that's, that's been, been, been worked on uh, is the, is move and the move VM uh, and the smart contracting language and, and the way that it's been built. Um, I think there's an, it's un, like Facebook undeniably has made contributions to technology, uh, over the last decade that, uh, has moved, moved markets, moved entire markets, whether it's mobile, whether it's advertising. Um, and, and now I'm, I think 
I'm really excited by uh, the, te the technology contribution to the blockchain and crypto space. Um, I think that uh, there's a tremendous amount of talent and work, uh, sorry, talent from Facebook and work that's going into this project. Uh, and that, that, that to me is like a sort of a tide that raises all, a tide that rises all boats um, in a sense that it's setting a bar very, very high from a technical perspective about what it means like to, to, to build this kind of a project. Um, yes, you're hundred percent right. Like it's not, you know, it's, it's a permission, it's, it's going to be a permission network and we, we just announced that. And yes, it's, you know, got like regulatory uh, and compliance uh, sort of connections to it in, in, in a sense, like how, how to, to launch the project itself. Um, but the, the technology is, is really sound, like really, really sound. Like if, if, if all we get out of this is move and the move VM, I would be, I think that the crypto and blockchain space should be very happy because it's, it's quite cool. And, and there's a few projects that have been working on integrating move into their uh, projects, uh, into their protocols. Um, and it's not even, you know, technically live yet. Uh, so, so that's been pretty impressive. Um, also to get, I mean, it's actually not the first thing that Facebook would be open sourcing or anything like that. They've open sourced plenty of stuff, but to get them to open source a blockchain and crypto project and sort of do it in the open and see the code that's happening, the code, the code that's being built and see it live as it's happening is probably very good for everyone in the crypto and blockchain space as well. Um, so those are, those are the key, those are the key things, uh, putting into action publicly, uh, another, uh, Byzantine fault tolerant, uh, consensus network is great. It's great for everybody. You know, one more test case, uh, you know, right now we have Tezos and Cosmos and Algorand and, you know, a couple others. Uh, I don't want to not, I don't want to name too many and not name other ones, but, uh, it's really great to see another one out. Like at the end of the day, like, these are still very much in the early experimental phases. Um, just so to see them out and at scale is huge. Um, the last thing I will say, and this is something that is a little bit less about specifically the technology itself, but um, one of the things that was super exciting for me to get involved with the Libra project, and there's, there's plenty of things that created pause as well, um, but one of the things that was super exciting to me was um, this idea of working on a project that uh, had a different type of distribution channel and distribution method um, that could be absolutely dwarfing to sort of everything else in the crypto space. And I think that that mm -hmm. um, maybe isn't as well understood as it should be. I think people understand like Facebook is big, um, but the Libra association actually includes Facebook and includes, you know, Uber and Lyft. Uh, it includes Shopify and, you know, like there, there's like lots of folks um, uh, in the, in the association. And uh, it's very, very cool um, to see, uh, uh, the sort of scale that, um, this could, this could be deployed at. Makes sense. Um, I, uh, I, I put myself in the cautiously optimistic camp. I was actually hoping that it would, it would take off as a permissionless system because I'd been, um, pretty outspoken about Libra being an excellent lead blocker for the rest of <laughs> the crypto industry, uh, and our, our general ability to hide in plain sight. But I think that the, you know, coronavirus and macro trends are kind of ruining that anyway. Yeah. Um, but that can be true too, be, though. Right? Big time. Mm -hmm. Like Libra can still be a lead blocker for, for, uh, the rest of the crypto space too. They're, they're not mutually. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Like it doesn't need well, to be uh, for that to be true. You know, I, uh, I think if you, if you just think about like, you know, gaming this out, um, you know, the whole world is distracted by the coronavirus pandemic. The, the yep. question is ultimately going to be, you know, what happens to, to currencies, emerging market currencies first and foremost, which is where yep. the problems are really going to be. Yep. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, will China's digital currency uh, play a role in some of the Southeastern Asian countries, maybe if they have uh, emerging market crises? Yep. Um, and then uh, how fast can Libra get out the door? Is that like the Western alternative? Uh, all of a sudden, you know, Zuckerberg goes from public enemy number one to like, please release Libra so that we don't lose our reserve status okay. to, to China. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, all the, all the while you've got, you know, Bitcoin and all these other uh, Web3 systems that could, uh, you know, basically hide in plain sight for an extended period of time. Yep. Um, whether that comes to fruition uh, is, it remains to be seen. But I, I feel like the fact that you do have Libra versus DCEP um, coming at the same time. Yeah. It's like everybody's distracted by, you know, the, the top card. And really it's just like the heavyweights dancing around each other for 10 rounds and, and not really throwing any punches. When yeah. all the interesting shit is like the welterweights that are just slamming at each other 
for, yeah. for like the full 15 rounds and, <laughs> and going back and forth and actually drawing blood, you know? So, um, uh, whereas, you know, there's going to be a knockout blow from the heavyweights and if the U S government says no, then it's, you know, okay, there's not right. much of a match to watch. Right. That's right. So, yeah, um, no, that's, that's a great, that's also a great analogy. I love it. And also, you know, worth highlighting, you know, bison trails as a company, supports, like you said at the beginning, like 20 plus, I think it's something like tw oh, close to 25 different protocols in different stages of live test net, pre main net, whatever you want to call it. Um, and Libra is one of the protocols we support. You know, it's not, we're, we're, we're sort of thinking about that in a similar fashion, which is like, there's a lot going on here, but there's so much interesting activity happening uh, at the, the welfare weight uh, <laughs> class. Um, and it's just incredibly, incredible to be a part of. Um, you, you guys uh, running all this infrastructure, uh, just aside from the anecdotal, uh, like like we've been talking about with Libra, you have a bunch of hard data on these projects. Um, mm -hmm. How have you how have you thought about packaging that? Uh, is it is it accessible, or or, or do you have a, a sandbox in place where folks can start to query some of these systems? Because you know one of the um, one of the most interesting opportunities uh you know that that i would see you know as as an infrastructure company maybe is just um converting this into like queryable databases right and and big query started to do this with the proof of work systems yeah but there is no such thing for proof of stake systems yeah and to a certain extent that's holding back the overall ecosystem development because you know, if you're thinking about making a staking decision or investment decision, and you don't know what the inflation rate is or how much money you're going to make or, or what the network fees are, it, um, it can get pretty, uh, pretty overwhelming pretty quickly. And, and unless you're actually running the infrastructure, you don't see it. Uh, is, that, is that like a public good? Or do you think that there's, you know, uh, something that you'll spin up on the data side in the coming quarters, years? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think that we, so we know... Uh, we know that what you're describing is a problem. I think, I think like what we, we've recognized, not, not necessarily a problem, but an interesting opportunity and a challenge for the space, right? A challenge for the space, an interesting opportunity um, uh, for, for us. I would say I'd probably go back to this idea that we're trying to stay as focused as we possibly can. And I think that, um, you know, nailing down the infrastructure itself and making sure that these networks are secure, orchestrated, well-deployed, reliable, and safe is an incredibly, incredibly important role that we take very, very seriously. Um, with that, we understand that um, we also have like data integrity and data security and, and also data you know, availability responsibilities. Um, so we're trying to be really careful there in a sense that like, you know, if you're running a node on using Bison Trails to run a node on a network, like, do you own that data? Is that a public good to the ecosystem because it's on a blockchain? Um, and what is our role play there? And we're, we, to be entirely transparent, we haven't figured it out entirely. Um, we, and that's because we've just been spending all of our time making sure these networks run really, really well. Um, I agree with you that the, the data piece is important, like, a, a, and a huge opportunity and will help the ecosystem, um, whether that's a product or a, 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 a a public good or, you know, queryable, um, uh, externally queryable is really still up in the air. We're, we're not a hundred percent sure. Um, I do know that there are, are pieces to our product and our platform, things like blockchain reporting, um, that we offer. That's a, you know, a big driving uh, point for people using Bison Trails. Uh, and it's not an easy problem to solve. All of these different protocols are different. They're nuanced, um, understanding how the data is structured, building it in a way that is queryable uh, and making that accessible to our customers is, is a non-trivial challenge. Um, and it's something that we are, we're working, we're definitely working on and working closely with, with our customers to figure out, like I help identify, like what are the things that are most useful? And um, it would be great to talk to some folks, folks in the ecosystem, um, different folks in the ecosystem that are interested in that because it can probably help us um, do best for everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'll sidebar at the end of this conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's, but, let's, uh, let's talk data later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's one of the most maddening problems. You know, you, uh, first of all, every, every single major data uh, vendor has different trading volume numbers, different circulating supply numbers, different staking yield numbers, uh, different interest rate uh, figures. Like it's, it's just complete fucking chaos. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of the, you know, uh, a lot of the providers that are trying to work on this are, you know, they're good. Right. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
most, most of them are, are competitors, but um, I think we're all pretty good at just uh, taking different methodologies, which is, yep. uh, and, and, and a lot of it's because there, there are so many edge cases in these new systems. Um, yep. So, you know, final, you. yeah, f final, final thought on, um, you know, just trends that you see with, with some of these um, different, you know, web three protocols. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you must have a, a much better intuition at this point on teams that will hit their projections in terms of milestones <laughs> and, and, and progress on the, the development roadmap versus um, which teams are just chronically missing. Um, and I don't expect you to name names. And, and by the way, this isn't necessarily an indictment of the, of the quality of the, um, uh, of the team or, or, or how ambitious their vision is because, you know, you might put someone like, um, you know, the, the ETH2 crowd in the Elon Musk camp where they just have these like wildly ambitious plans yeah. and, you know, they're, they're consistently coming up short in terms yep. of stated goals, but still making a hell of a lot of progress in the meantime. And then yeah. um, there are much quieter, uh, faster moving protocols that are, are more like the Steve Jobs camp where they're just sandbagging the shit out of everything and, and, and kind of very move, moving very aggressively. Um, w maybe without naming names and kind of talking about, you know, uh, well, I, I don't know if you're, if you're comfortable, you know, how, how do you kind of think about the different teams uh, and um, uh, you know, how, how quickly they're moving uh, versus, you know, how complex their blockchains are. And if yeah. you, if you want to pass on that, then uh, no. I understand, but I won't appreciate it. <laughs> so I won't, I won't, I won't call out specific projects on either side. Um, okay. What I will do though, is I'll say, yes, we've been, we've gotten very good and it's taken a while, but we've gotten really good at understanding what are some of the key signals to, to, to seeing or being able to predict how close a team is to actually getting to where it wants to be or where it's state, stating it's going to be. Um, that's an that's not a that's not an easy thing to do. It does involve being pretty close to the code itself and understanding the code that's being built. Um, but it's not it's not an impossible task. Um, what I will say that there is an undeniable truth about blockchain protocols, and that is the more decentralized and open source and open governance open governance there is, the slower that they move. Always that is like a consistent truth. So the smaller the team the more closed off they are, the more centralized they are, the less external contributors to the code base there is, the faster they move. And that is hands down, every time I've seen that, I've yet to see a more open team move faster than a more closed team. I know it sounds sort of obvious, um, and I might be just stating the obvious, but that is that is a truth. So when you take a project like ETH and ETH2 in the community, you know, ETH is, is you know, incredible as a community and incredible as a developer community, um, but they've got a lot of, governance to deal with, a lot of discussions to have, have um, and a lot of consensus to create within the ecosystem, the community. And then you have a project, you know, like one of these Ethereum friends, like you've been, like you've said, uh, that maybe is just the founding team and it's just, you know, seven people and maybe they're venture back so they don't have to worry about grants and maybe they're, uh, or, or they're self-funded because they're really, really successful entrepreneurs from something else. Uh, you know, so we, we've seen kind of the gamut and um, those teams tend to move a lot faster. What I will say is that almost every single person we've worked with, every single person, every single team we've worked with has missed dates and is late. And, and that's just an, the nature of building very ambitious, very hard projects. Um, I've been asked a few times, like who are some of, like not even in the context of crypto, but just like who are some of the most interesting people that like, or, or people that I admire the most. And I almost always talk about the protocol founders that we work with. Um, they are like crazy ambitious. Um, sometimes they're thinking through like these insane ideas and they're trying to put, bring them to, re, to, the, to real life all in the public eye. And I'm just like, this is so, so, so hard to do. Um, and so, yeah, so, um, there's definitely like a gamut across the board. We're getting better and better at it. It's one of those things like I actually would love to, um, you know, with permission of some of these teams, like at some point maybe talk about or write about, <laughs> I would, I would never do it with that unless, unless I talk to them about it first. Yeah, that's a, it's a, a, a dangerous, uh, can of worms that you'd be opening up otherwise. Well, there are um, allies too, right? Like we work, you know, yeah. we work gr great with, with the protocol teams themselves as well as the funds and the custodian yeah, yeah. exchanges. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it does make uh, intuitive sense that some of the more open teams are, are moving faster because it's the same way, you know, if you make a public resolution, 
yeah. uh, after New Year's, you're, you're more likely to succeed or like public <laughs> pronouncement that you're, Is that true? you're creating a new habit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Um, just putting something out there and kind of forcing accountability. You know, this was, um, uh, ironically, this is how I got into the industry in a roundabout way, because I was in the middle of shutting down my, um, my previous startup and it had been through a summer accelerator. And I went to, I think it was HubSpot's conference. Um, yeah, HubSpot's marketing, uh, content marketing, uh, conference. And there was a speaker that talked about, um, like her weight loss challenge, which was just like taking a sweaty selfie every day. Um, <laughs> And then she also applied that to like writing and she's like, you know, instead of just like writing like a couple paragraphs and like keeping it in Evernote or whatever, like the default system was yeah, just like push it to medium or Tumblr, or, you know, whatever. Right. And, um, and tell people about it. So they read it and they make fun of you and, and right. you know, a, you develop a thick skin and B, you know, you stop caring and C, you, you, you're getting peer review, which yeah. um, most people like, that's all they want. They, they want the attention of publishers. And right. um, uh, it, you know, it, it absolutely, uh, is the first thing that I recommend for non-technical people when they get into the space. It's like, you want a job in crypto and you're not technical? Well, you you bet your ass you better develop a public persona and an audience of some kind <laughs> because there's just not that many people that are going to be interested. Yeah. Um, if if you're young, uh, you can't write and uh, you don't code. So right. uh, you, better, you better hop on it. And I, I'd imagine um, just in terms of like pace and in terms of uh, uh, staying comfortably uncomfortable having a set of milestones to march towards and knowing that all of your competitors see that as well um, has to be uh, a, a pretty meaningful forcing function. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my, my last question, uh, which I just started asking recently, I wish I'd been doing it all along because I'd, I'd be able to actually do the casting. Um, HBO is going to write a series about crypto at some point, you know, it's going to happen, you know, it's going to be, uh, it's either going to be terrible or it's going to be great. Yeah. Um, and uh, who in that uh, in that scenario do you want playing Joe uh, as, and, and cast in that role? <laughs> oh man, uh, who would I want playing Joe? Um, it wait is Joe a villain or a hero in this? In this, <laughs> you, you know, this is that like. Uh, the, the folks in crypto are exponential thinkers because I just uh, had this conversation um, with, um, with uh, the, uh, the Bit Bitfinex founder uh, just a little while ago. So um, both, you know, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you can pick one, of, maybe you can pick one of each um, mm -hmm. or you can triangulate in an actor that could go either way. Um, let's see. I think, uh, I feel like, you know, it'd have to be like a method, either like a comedian or like a method actor, you know? So like, let's go like, you know, full on Bill Murray, <laughs> like, like just, just the, the, the time the machine humor. Bill Murray. Yeah, time, yeah, exactly. That, that's who, that's who it would be. Or, or just him at 70. Just or uh, actually, honestly, yeah. him at 70 would be amazing too. Yeah. Like that would be, that would be both uh, aspirational for Joe in real life. Uh, as well as I think like he could probably play um, both, the, the balance between a hero and a villain. You could probably do both. <laughs> and I, uh, I like to, I like to, I like to smile a lot and laugh a lot and make other people laugh. And I don't take myself too seriously. So did you, like, did you have a second method actor involved? Um, I was thinking like, you know, I, I, well, this is influenced because I just, I just rewatched um, Joker and I thought that Joaquin Phoenix did this incredible job of telling the line between both a hero and a villain. I mean, I know he's a villain and he's very mm -hmm. much a villain, um, but the way gonna, that- How fucking dark do you have to be, man? <laughs> to be like, oh, he's kind of, I can see him being a hero a little bit, right? There's I'm this one this. scene at the end of the movie, which I'm not it's gonna okay. ruin the movie, but there's a scene where he's like standing on a car and he's like kind of like got his arms up yeah. in the air and there's people around him cheering and you're like, oh my God, there's like a hero element to this. Mm -hmm. This movie is so messed up. That's <laughs> yeah, what makes know? it so dark, exactly. Yeah, it's so dark, but uh, you know, obviously like, I wish I was complex enough that a method actor like that would have to <laughs> have to step in. But sadly, Bill Murray would probably do a great job. Bill Murray and Groundhog Day. <laughs> that's, you know, that's not a bad life goal. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Joe, uh, it's been fun uh, catching up. Uh, excited for everything that's been coming out uh, of Bison Trails and uh, look forward to, uh, to more coming out the rest of the year. Where can people find you uh, and the company on Twitter awesome. and the interwebs? Yeah, um, Ryan, thanks so much for having me. And obviously, this was this was an absolute blast. I hope it's not the last time we do this. 
Um, and uh, you can find us at bisontrails.co uh, uh, on the internet or at bison trails on Twitter. Uh, feel free to reach out, uh, hi at bisontrails.co or on Twitter. Um, we love when people ask us questions and talk to us. And um, if you're interested in anything that we do, our services or knowing more about the protocols we work with, um, don't be shy. Excellent. Joe, thank you. And thank you everyone for listening and tuning in for this most recent episode of Unqualified Opinions. We'll be right back in two or four days, depending on which day of the week this drops. Stay safe, be good, and until next time, peace.